Welcome to The Better Part. Today we'll be talking to two women athletes on their sport, and we'll also be discussing the 40th anniversary of Title IX. Please stay tuned. Welcome to The Better Part, a program that encompasses a diverse spectrum of topics important to our community, which we hope will both inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy the program. Hello, I'm Phil Linehan for The Better Part. Uh, today's guests are two women athletes. Our first guest is Nora Grisham and she's the president of the Northern California Women's Hockey League and is the goalkeeper on her hockey team. And our next guest is Ann Ernst, and she's a hockey player. So let's start with you, Nora. Tell us just a little bit about your background other than playing hockey. So outside of playing sports, I um, currently work for PayPal, and I lead a software development team. Oh, very nice. And Ann, what do you do? I am the editor of Cupertino Patch. And how did you wind up in ice hockey, women's ice hockey? About seven years ago, a coworker of mine invited me to attend Give Hockey a Try Day, which is something that the Northern California Women's Hockey League puts on a couple times a year to introduce new women into the sport. What we do is we loan out gear to about 30 skaters, and we put them through a practice and a scrimmage, and that's how we get new people introduced to the sport and also new, new members entering our league. I went, I tried it, I thought it was a lot of fun, and I was kind of hooked, and so I've been playing hockey ever since. Very nice. And Well, I grew up in Michigan, and in a cold state, and <laughs> right on a lake, and there was always ice around in the winter time. I was not allowed to play hockey, though, with my brothers because they were afraid I'd get hurt. So I used figure skates. Um, and then when I moved to California and got hooked on the San Jose Sharks, my husband was the one who encouraged me to start playing myself. So I started taking classes at what was then called Logitech. It's now Shark's Ice at San Jose. Um, and I took lessons for a little while and then finally got onto a co-ed team. And then from there, I met somebody who's involved in the NCWHL in one of the classes, and she encouraged me to join the NCWHL, the Women's Hockey League. So I played with Nora for a while there, and then because of timing and the locations of where they play, I went back to the co-ed team. So I'm now playing co-ed, but mm -hmm. I got hooked. Very nice. How extensive is women's hockey? I, I was a little surprised when I heard you played hockey, ice hockey. Mm -hmm. And um, how extensive is women's ice hockey? So there's, um, in, in North America, there's actually quite a bit of women's hockey. There's oh. over um, half a million women's hockey players in Canada and almost half a million registered women's hockey players in the United States. Um, worldwide, there's over 1.5 million uh, women's hockey players. Oh, wow. Is it an, it's an Olympic sport, I know that, but how in the beginning it was just a few teams were invited. It, what is it now? Mm -hmm. is it, how big an Olympic sport is it now? Well, it started, it became an Olympic sport for women in 1998, and that's when you, we also found a huge spike in interest in women's hockey. Um, I know several people who were, are part of the NCWHL who joined after 1998 started looking for a place to play. Um, it's still an Olympic sport, but because the North American teams, United States and Canada, are wildly dominant, I, they, they kill the other teams, um, like 18 to nothing, 15 to nothing. I mean, it's, it's very unbalanced. There, there is a threat that um, women's ice hockey will be pulled for, as an Olympic sport at some point if they don't see more growth in some of the other countries. Is the Russian ice hockey culture passed on to the women in Russia? Do you see anything of the Russian teams? Um, there are Russian teams, but they were one of the ones that was beaten 18 to nothing, oh, I believe, if I'm remembering yes. correctly on the, that's <laughs> the score. How does women's hockey differ from men's hockey? Is it the same, the same game? Or? So it's basically, it's exactly the same game, all of the same rules. The only difference that you'll see in men's um, junior and professional hockey is that there's checking allowed, and there's no checking allowed in any women's hockey. And I'd like to add to that, I've talked to many people, men in particular, who have said that 
when they watch, a lot of men that I've talked to have daughters who play, and they say that when they watch the girls play, they they believe it's a more pure form of the mm -hmm. sport because it's not, it doesn't have the checking. There's more skill involved in, in women's ice hockey because they can't bump somebody yeah. off the puck yeah. as easily. So you have to learn skill with you know puck handling and stick handling. Hey, uh, we have some videos which you have provided me with, and let's let's watch them now. Looks like a fun sport. I don't think I'll be doing it, but it <laughs> looks like a fun sport. Uh, what have you two uh, gained individually from participating in women's ice hockey? Um, so I've gotten a lot of things out of it. One of the things is it gave me, I realized when I was younger that I always had a sport that I was learning and playing. And picking up women's hockey as an adult gave me the opportunity to go through that same process and really get the value of trying and focusing and developing those skills. It's also introduced me to hundreds of women and men in the Bay Area who I never would have interacted with. And so I've made some great friends and it's given me the opportunity to share sports with women who didn't necessarily grow up playing sports and share the experience with people at all ages. And I love the camaraderie, the team spirit, um, and I play with, it's mostly men on my team now, but like Nora says, I, I met people that I would not have met otherwise um, in the women's sport, and it's something that you can share with them. Um, I love talking hockey. I love you know, playing hockey, it's just to me one of the greatest sports that there is and it's just a lot of fun. Okay, well let's now move on to Title IX. Now this is the 40th anniversary of Title IX and explain what is Title IX. So Title IX is not necessarily just about sports. Um, when it was passed there's 10 provisions to it including, and it's all geared toward equal access. Um, access to higher education, career education, education for pregnant and parenting students, employment, learning environment, math and science, sexual harassment, standardized testing, and technology. So it, even though we think of Title IX as being mostly about sports and a lot of times it, it gets wrapped around collegiate sports, um, it's much more all-encompassing than that. How well was Title IX accepted in the beginning? Do you remember? It, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> there were, it was a battle with a lot of um, colleges in particular who felt that Title IX was taking away money from the men's teams. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't viewed as, oh, we need to give equal access to women. It was, you're taking something away from us. So there were, there were challenges to it along the way. Well, I remember a congressman, I, I read this, I wasn't there to remember it, but he, he said, if we allow this bill, we'll most likely have men stewardesses on the airplane someday. <gasps> Which was exactly... Oh, sh what shock happened. and horror. <laughs> yes. How has this impacted sports in high schools and colleges? So I think, I, I mean, you see sports being available to girls and to women throughout throughout colleges. I, from, from my own experience, I was, I was born after Title IX was passed. It was never a question of whether I would be able to play a sport. It was just, here are, the, here are the sports that are available, what are you going to go play? And so the difference is really in availability and acceptance, rather than a girl having to go out of her way and say, I really, really want to play sports. Can you please let me play in the Little League? Can you please let me play on the boys' teams? There's an outlet for all of these young women to go play sports and learn, uh, learn about athletics. And I'd like to add to that that some of the statistics that I looked up um, included 
So before Title IX, one in 27 girls played in high school sports. There were virtually no college scholarships available to women. Um, and now, like Nora said, you find it's, it's very common and it's accepted. Um, when I grew up, so I, I was born before Title IX, mm -hmm. I was a young girl when it was passed, and I have four older brothers who all played baseball, Little League baseball and beyond, and I wanted to do the same thing, but was not allowed. It was absolutely forbidden, and now you get to see little girls playing on Little League teams with the boys, and then there's also girls' teams, but there was nothing like that for me as a child, so I feel like I missed out on a lot of things. When they implemented Title IX, some of the men's sports were eliminated. Wrestling and gymnastics are two I read about. How would you explain that to those men that lost their sport? Well, they didn't technically lose their sport. It was a matter of um, providing funding for the sports at the college teams, and it was up to the colleges to decide where they put that money. Because if you think about it, playing basketball doesn't require as much it, money going into the equipment and to the facilities as does something like football or ice hockey for that matter. We have a lot of equipment that we need for ice hockey. It's one of the mm -hmm. most expensive sports there mm -hmm. is to participate in. Um, soccer, you don't need a lot. So if you have a women's soccer team, you're not spending the same amount of money as you are with a football team. So they chose, they may have chosen to do away with men's gymnastics or wrestling in order to fund the other teams. It wasn't that they picked one and they had to cut something, they just had to provide equal access. If I could add, mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other factor that comes in with a lot of colleges is that football teams are huge. They usually carry about 85 athletes. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the percentage is supposed to equal the percentage of the women's population, just by having such a large sport in football, it means that other men's sports, other smaller men's sports, get impacted. So you both came up, you bridged Title IX. So to tell me how coming up without sports and then coming up with sports, how, how that went. Let's start with you, Nora. So I, um, as I said, I was born, at, born after Title IX. So sports were always just a matter of fact thing that I was going to do. It was mm -hmm. an expectation in my house, in my family, that, that myself, my brother, and my sister would all play sports while we were growing up. Okay, so and you so didn't bridge it. You started, you had it from the beginning. I had it from the beginning. Oh, okay. So, um, so what's been interesting is as I've, as I've grown up, as I've met more women through the, through the NCWHL who didn't get that opportunity, who are like, hey, I never thought I could play a sport. Um, it made me really recognize how valuable that experience was. And what we've been seeing, my sister's much younger than I am, and what I've seen is just the participation between uh, when I was young and then 10 years later when she was, when she was growing up. Um, the amount of participation in women's athletics has, in girls' athletics, has just dramatically increased. So that you have all sorts of girls playing different sports, swimming, soccer, softball, baseball, basketball. Um, just There's more access and it's just more standard like expected that kids will play sports. Now, and you bridged it, right? Right. You were born before, and you it came somewhere in your life. How did, how was the beginning, and then how was it after Title IX? I always felt that <coughs> it wasn't fair that I didn't get to play some of the sports that my brothers did, um, and also because they did play sports, they were given an opportunity for a college scholarship that was not afforded to me because it. We didn't have the opportunity to play sports like the boys did. Mm -hmm. um, and it sets that expectation, too, that as a child, if you don't have people in front of you doing that, you don't go into it thinking, as Nora said, oh, it's there, people ahead of me have already done this, I get to do it, too. I didn't have that as like a role model, so to speak, that there were other athletes out there. and. You know, I grew up during the time of Billie Jean King and um, Bobby Riggs playing one another, and that was a huge ordeal. And, you know, oh my gosh, there's a woman playing a man in a sport, in tennis. And, you know, now you don't think anything of that if, you know, a man and a woman go out and play tennis together, or golf, or whatever it is. It's not, it's not that odd anymore. But when I was growing up, 
these were things that just weren't done. And I have a mother who is now 83 years old, and she comes from a generation where women don't do that kind of thing. And so she prepared me for the way that she was raised. You know, mm -hmm. women don't do these things. They don't, they don't go to college. They don't play sports. They don't do these other things. And, you know, I was encouraged to do the route that, you know, a, a, a young I'm lady a, should. A young lady. Yes, should take. But I was a tomboy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had four older brothers. I wanted to, you know, I'm wearing my brother's clothes whenever I could, baseball mm -hmm. hats, playing, you know, playing with them whenever I can. And my next door neighbor was a boy, and we were always playing sports together. But not organized sports so it's it's wonderful for me to look at the young girls and the opportunities that they have now and I think it will just like the difference between you and your sister the age difference look at what a difference that has made and as we go down and the generations passed on you know they will get to see the role models such as Nora and her sister and it will just it'll take more time of course before it's just kind of much more standardized and just expected but for me to see it all happen in my lifetime it's a wonderful experience are sports really important to women growing up i mean oh absolutely does it make a difference I, I, it makes a huge difference <laughs> um so i uh i played volleyball uh through college and um and actually my sister and my cousin are both uh, both played through college, volleyball through college as well and what you get out of sports are are just a number a number of benefits. So you learn about leadership, and you learn about the different types of leadership that you can play. Sometimes you're going to be the person who, you know, is going to score the winning run or is going to score the winning basket. Sometimes you're a supporting player for that to to help make that happen. You learn that it's not all about immediate term success that sometimes you have to take a long view on what success means because you're not going to win you're not going to go out and win every game you um, you learn kind of a just a self confidence and a self reliance that comes from putting in this kind of effort into becoming better at your sport and and improving so there there are, there are huge benefits that you see when you have girls who are playing in, who are playing team sports, who are participating in that in that as they grow up, and it ends up having an impact as they move into the workforce and in their later lives. Yeah. I would agree with everything. I think that it um, it teaches you that you're not always going to get what you want in life. It it helps you cope with disappointment. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who don't handle it well if they haven't gone through that process and I know I've talked to employers who now employers who are hiring the younger generation who talk about how they don't have problem-solving skills at times and I think that's something that you do learn from playing sports is you know how you get through this maybe you're in a slump and you're losing all the time how do you get through this or you know your your teammate isn't playing as well as they normally do or you're not playing as well so you learn how to to overcome certain things and to cope and sometimes there's disappointment in life well we did a program on Cupertino Little League and I hope I get this correct the coaches that were here said well we teach the kids that if you do not get a hit 70% of the times you're still batting 300 and that's very successful mm -hmm. so you have to get used to, to striking out that that's mm -hmm. just part of the game and that's part of life right. absolutely is there a correlation between successful women in sports um, there absolutely is uh, before before that just to, to sure. um, make your point um, one of the things, so as I, I, I skate and I also play goalie, as you mentioned, one of the things that I constantly remind myself when a puck goes in is that the best goalies in the world, like NHL, world-class goalies, mm -hmm. the puck goes in between 9 and 10% of the time. So, so it's, it's, you, have to, you have to say, all right, it went in, shake it off, get over it, and move on. Yeah. And huge, hugely important life skill in general. Um, there are some studies that have shown the impact that um, women's sports have. So um, there was a 2002 study that showed that um, 80, I believe it was 82% of female executives had participated in organized sports when they were younger. It showed that while only one in six women, consider, adult women, considered themselves athletic, that number rose to almost 50% when you talked about adult women who were making over $75,000 a year. 
Um, there was another study by the woman who is now the chief economist for the Department of Labor that recently came out that demonstrated that the impact that Title IX has had on that quote unquote first generation of girls who grew up like myself knowing about Title IX, the impact that that has had is that it has increased their education achievements by 20% and it's increased their employment levels by 40%. So women's athletics has a huge impact on girls, not just in their, in their youth, but also in their adult lives. So it's the team playing and the accepting yeah. failure and pressing on. Ab absolutely, and learning how, to, learning how to set a goal and achieve it. I think um, when I when I think about you know teamwork, I think about mm -hmm. when I was in school. You know, you'd have the okay, we're going to do a group project, and it, it was always it was always a little bit forced. You know, okay, we're going to get together and we're all going to work together because the teacher says we have to. But when you get into a team sport, I mean, it it is a group project. You learn everything about teamwork, about how to manage different personalities, about how to work with somebody who you don't necessarily want to go have ice cream with later. Um, those are life skills that that are naturally taught through athletics. Okay, you have any comments on that? Well, I agree. They're they're transferable from, like in our case, from the ice to the conference room. Mm -hmm. um, you may not. I, I love the idea that you may not want to go have ice cream with this person, but you want to pass them the puck, you know, and get, <laughs> help them get the puck into the net That's because true. you know they can. And it's no different than if in a conference room, in a meeting, you don't like the person who's sitting across from you, but they're on your team and they're part of the whole process of completing your job. And if it's something that you have learned from playing ice hockey or soccer or basketball or whatever it is, you think to yourself, okay, I don't like passing the puck to her, but I know she can get the puck in the net, so I'm going to do it. I know you can get the job done, so I know that you're going to, you're a good team player and you can carry on with this project or whatever it might be. Okay, let's talk about scholarships. Were there more scholarships mm -hmm. generated as a result of Title IX for women? Absolutely. So um, there's, uh, my understanding is that really before Title IX there were very, very few women's scholarships. And now, um, and now if you want, if you want to get a scholarship, if you are excelling in your sport, there are hundreds and thousands of opportunities for you to have the financial assistance to play that sport and get a college education at the same time. I'm told that some of the um, very minor sports have to offer scholarships uh, just to balance things out and it's a uh, team that, as you said before, that doesn't require much equipment but does give the population of athletes on mm -hmm. the women's side. So parents should look at what sports their kids are playing in and maybe steer them to an odd sport to get a scholarship. Where can we get information on these scholarships? So there's, you know, I, I think all the information you could possibly want you can find online. There's, um, there's a website called collegescholarships.org that um, has a large athletic section that will, will start to get you information. I think the other thing is to seek out women or men who have played sports in college, who went through the process of getting a, getting a scholarship. They'll be able to give some real-time advice and some real-world advice about what to expect, what is the process like, and um, even how to go about contacting coaches for, um, for potential opportunities. Okay. What would you advise parents who have young girls right now to do sports-wise? So I think I think that there are a couple of things that I that that will help get girls into sports. One is exposing them to all of the different sports that are out there. So we live in the Bay Area, and there's there's lots of colleges around, lots of high school teams, lots of club teams. There's the NCWHL. There's a lot of opportunities to just go see girls and women playing sports because just just seeing that helps a girl think oh hey I could do that that person looks something like me I could be doing that I think the other thing that I would strongly encourage parents to do is to focus on being supportive and encouraging the participation but not overly focus on the outcome especially as somebody's learning a new sport it can be hard you're not you haven't yet become really coordinated it's, it's a complicated sport. I grew up playing volleyball. It, it's, there's a lot of coordination involved to, to make something happen. And um, if, if a parent is focusing on, did you try your best? Are you, are you, you know, having fun and are you really working hard at that? 
that's the root of it. When a parent gets too focused on, did you win? It, it ends up having a negative impact on, on the child and they start to lose some of the joy that they could get out of that sport. Well, the clock is running out on the scoreboard, so to speak. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you both for joining us. And uh, we enjoyed the show. And I'm going to read a couple of things since I'm an ex-runner. And I want to read some numbers about women in, in running longer distance because I was a marathoner. The first woman to run the Boston Marathon was Katherine Schweitzer. And she ran uh, a bootleg. And at about mile 20, Jock Simple, the race director, raced out on the course to try to drag her off the course. And she had two burly guys pacing her, and he did not succeed. <laughs> in 1972, the first woman ran in the Boston Marathon, and there were eight other women that started with her, and they all finished. So women are not as frail as those Olympic guys were saying all the time. Uh, the Olympic Marathon in 1984, Joan Benoit finished in 224.52, well ahead of the field, and she just blew everything away, and that was the first first Olympic marathon for women. And the one I like most, the current record for women in the Western States 100 mile endurance run, which starts in Squaw Valley and goes through the mountains to Auburn is 16 hours and 47 minutes. And that was at one point in time, the men's record. So women are doing very well in sports and I'm very happy. Thank you for joining us. We hope that we were able to encourage young women, older women, any women, to go out and find a sport and enjoy it and reap the benefits from it. And parents out there, we hope we were able to steer you in the direction of some scholarships for your young women athletes. Thank you. See you next week.